Look at that. Have I been talking this whole time to a blank camera screen? Could you hear me? No. You couldn't? Have I been talking this whole time to a blank camera screen? Oh. Could you hear me? No, there we go. Okay. All right, wave to the camera and say, I save the day. I save the day. This is why you have kids. Yeah. All right, wave to the camera and say, I save the day. Okay, bye. <laughs> all right guys i am sorry uh i'm obviously a serious novice when it comes to live stream so let's start again here uh maybe i can even say it better grass seed in the spring thank you uh thank you sam to my son um my name is brian mounts i run turf mechanic and i usually make pre-produced videos i almost never do a live stream like you're watching right now so Ah, I'm not a professional here. I'd never claim to be. Back behind me, you're going to see kids playing. This is how my channel tends to be. I don't claim to be an expert in technology um, and obvious for obvious reasons, but I do know my stuff in the grass. So when to get started here for the second time, um, I want to talk to you guys about grass seed simply because in my real life, like as I walk around and see my friends and family and their friends and their family, I actually get questions a lot about putting grass seed down this time of year. Um, that's not weird. Um, it makes perfect sense uh, because lawns come to life in the month of April and certainly by the month of May they're pretty much green and growing just about everywhere it makes sense to go and look in your lawn and say wow that could be better maybe I'll put some grass seed down so what I tell my friends and my family and what I'm gonna tell a lot of you people in comments as I get them is uh, the springtime is not the best time to put grass seed down for the vast majority of people hey you want to say hi? hi say hi you're not even on camera here you want to say hi? hi this is our friend here say hey okay all right go on back and play oh. yeah um the reason it's not the best time to put grass seed down in the spring tends to be because of soil temperatures. No matter where you live in the country, whether it's up north or down south, soil temperatures are almost always the first stumbling block to putting grass seed down. Warm season grasses, that soil temperature on average needs to be somewhere around 70 degrees, maybe even a little bit higher to have good germination rates. For cold season grasses, you really kind of need soil temperatures to be averaging kind of in that 55 degree range. Um, it's uh, it's not uncommon to have a few 70 degree days in the early parts of April and still have soil temperatures that are way too low. So if you, if you're putting grass seed down on soil, that's not warm enough, even if the outside air temperature seems warm enough, the seed isn't really going to germinate very well. And then eventually you're going to end up having a lot of loss because you're probably going to be watering the seed uh, for a long time, watering it on and off throughout the days, uh, trying to get it to germinate in low soil temperatures. And it's not going to want to do it. At some point, it's probably going to dry out. Some of it's going to die because it got too wet and it died uh, because it dried out. So, a lot of it, honestly, is going to get eaten up by birds. Um, and get scuffed up by, you know, kids playing on the lawn and animals running around. Um, so seeding is pretty hard. Now, especially certain other types of grass seed um, are going to be harder. So if you're looking at, say, for instance, a Kentucky bluegrass mix of grass seed, Kentucky bluegrass germinates very slowly, even under the best of conditions, compared to some of the other cold season grasses. Down south, most of the grass types germinate fairly slowly. It's not that slow in ideal circumstances for something like, say, for instance, a Bermuda grass or a zoysia to germinate. Um, but it's kind of on par with Kentucky bluegrass. It really takes a handful of weeks under the best of conditions to really get it going. And during those times, all of the weeds are germinating and starting to grow, and we can't prevent them with weed preventatives down south this is even a harder scenario because uh, your your best option for preventing weeds during seeding times is to apply a mesotrione product to the lawn it's something that inhibits um, photosynthesis uh, on the weed plants but, but many of the cold, uh, many of the warm season grasses uh, can be damaged or stunted by it 
So for instance, if you're putting mesotrion on uh, Bermuda grass or St. Augustine, uh, those grass types can damage um, if you're doing that. Now, I don't grow those grass types here, so I don't have personal experience watching those damage, those damages, but it's an illustration of if you're putting seed down, we can't put a weed pre-emergent down to stop weeds. And in some cases, we have to be very careful with uh, the photosynthesis inhibitors. That's just how I'm going to call it. Uh, your mesotrion products. You can find that in Scott's three-in-one build for seeding. You can find it in tenacity and also in generic form. Um, once you start getting into applying that sort of stuff, though, you're really getting beyond beginner lawn care. So like most of you, you have friends. Uh, many of you maintain fantastic lawns, but of your friends, of your friends, they're not experts. They do want green grass and they want their lawns to look great, but they're not experts, nor do they really care to become experts. Most people don't care to become an expert in everything that they're mildly interested in. So applying mesotrione at time of seeding is an option. And it's something that I've done in my lawn before. I have a whole video documenting uh, a couple of videos documenting the process of me using it on seeding patches here in the lawn. Um, it works, but the thing is it really needs to be reapplied over and over and over. The granular form of it, lots of people will put down the Scott's triple action because it's got a granular form of um, mesotrion in it. Uh, it'll go onto the, the soil. It has fertilizer built right into it. It's built for seeding, so it's, <clears throat> excuse me, so it's got a high concentration of uh, phosphorus in there. But the thing is, all the nitrogen is fast release. So we're putting nitrogen into the dirt before the seed has germinated. And it's used, uh, it's kind of broken down in the soil before the seed germinates. And then once the seed germinates, then the mesotrion has wore off because it really needs to be applied every three weeks. So the better option is to spray the tenacity or the generic mesotrion product on your soil at time of seeding and then wait for the seed to germinate. And then you come back, let's call it three weeks later after the seed has germinated and started growing because the seed itself contains the, nutri uh, the nutrients that grass needs to start growing for those first few weeks. You could grow grass from seed in sterile sand and it'll work but it'll only work for enough time as the seed is providing the nutrients to the grass. So in a lawn scenario, if you're getting that grass to germinate um, without fertilizing and we're spraying a mesotrion product over the top of it, then three weeks later, once that mesotrion wears off and weeds are now able to capture sunlight and photosynthesize properly the way that they're meant to, then we come back and then we could put down um that scott's triple action and it's probably a better time of the year anyway it's like mid to late spring at this point mid spring uh depending on when you're doing this let's call it late may uh to put down a urea nitrogen product um because that's going to push a lot of a lot of growth that will wear off before let's say before middle july um and it's got the it's got the phosphorus in there to help with rooting and whatnot um but Honestly, it's once you start doing these mesotrion products, because if you put that down uh, three weeks after seeding, then three weeks later, your seed is still very new. It's let's call it one month old. It's still too young, even under the best of uh, conditions. Like if you're using perennial rye and you're putting a pre-emergent down, um, it still needs to be at least, I think it's two and a half months mature before you can even put anything down at all. And that's the, the shortest duration, one of them all that I know of. So once it's one month old, it's not like we can go and put down a pre-emergent that's still going to kill off the grass. So we still have to continue this routine of putting mesotrion down to stop the weeds. So one of the things that I see that people do when they, when they seed and they use tenacity or a mesotrion product is they say, well, it kind of worked a little bit. Well, a lot of times it's not working because the routine of reapplication isn't there. So in my successful seeding where I used tenacity last spring on my perennial rye patch, um, I applied tenacity four times um, at roughly, it was roughly 24 day intervals, uh, four times. And 
at the end, by midsummer, everything looked fantastic and the patch was completely weed free. That's something that beginners just don't usually do. And that's one of the reasons why I don't really recommend a lot of beginners to do this. So I could go ahead and just talk and talk and talk. Um, but I do want to address some questions. Now, uh, before I address some questions, I'm going to say one, one more thing here. Um, spot seeding is different from overseeding, and it's going to be different from a full lawn re renovation. In some cases, yeah, it makes sense to spot seed and apply a pre-emergent. You just got to make sure that you give a big buffer window around your pre-emergent um, or uh, around your spot seeding area. So you're, you're applying pre-emergent around, but not in the spot that you want to repair. Now, there are other ways of repairing that spot, tiny little repair spots. I kid you not, like it's really easy to just grab a little bit of potting soil, throw some grass seed in it, mix it up inside your kitchen, get it wet, let it sit there on your kitchen counter for a couple of days, and then put it on the spot and then cover it up with your biggest Tupperware. Like seriously, that it works just fine. Just kind of tamp it down in the spot, cover it up with your Tupperware. It's going to keep critters from eating your seed, and the Tupperware will act like a uh, like a little mini greenhouse. Everything is going to come up quickly. Um, and then if you're putting pre-emergent around the edges of it, then that pre-emergent, so long as, I mean, I don't, personally, I don't know the exact diameter, how much space you need to give it, but if you're gonna give it like two inches, know, it might not work. If you're gonna give it like two feet, it probably will work. So somewhere in there, just use your best judgment um, and apply pre-emergent to everything except for the spots. So anyway, with that said, let me take a look at the comments that are coming in and the questions. All right, Michael uh, Spivy or Spivey uh, says, I hear you now. After I rambled on to myself with no camera for eight minutes. It's funny is I didn't even see, I didn't even see the chat um, until everything was operating. So uh, thank you for sticking around. Uh, John Woodchuck to Gray Squirrel. Okay, uh, there's Kloof Monster. That's my son. He's the one that actually saved the day today. Um, I get a little breeze here, so if... Uh, if the windscreen isn't working out, please let me know. Um, and I'm not sure what I'll do, but please let me know. Oh, there's Kluvmont. So he just showed up back there. Yeah, come in, man. Wave. He put a duck on the porch. All right. So there's a the duck there. That's thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, let's see. I need a fire true green. All right. Uh, David Gonzalez, love seeing you in comments on all of the main videos. Thanks for checking in here. Hello on lunch break. Uh, I put a duck on the porch. Windscreen is doing beautifully. Okay, good. Um, I want to open this up. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them uh, in the chat. All, all of you guys watching later on, uh, please put them in the comments. And I will monitor this live stream. I'm going to trim it. I think I can trim the front and the back. Uh, to, to kind of polish it up for watching at a later date. So please drop those comments, uh, those questions in the comments below, and I'll get to them whenever I can. As you see, I've got, I'm a busy guy. I got kids here and uh, I've got projects to deal with. Um, so I'm not available 100% of the time, but I try to be available as much as possible. Um, let me, before I get any questions here, I want to say, I have not seeded anything this spring. Um, the kids that you see behind me, and um, it's possible my friend uh, Phil has walked by. Phil's house, for those of you who have subscribed to the channel, watched some of the other videos, his house is the one that we are killing off with uh, glyphosate. We've done a couple rounds of it. I'm actually preparing the ground right now because we're finally entering into a stretch of temperature that's going to be in the low 60s. So I'm preparing the ground to put seed down over there. He lives in a heavy shade environment. So I'm going to be mixing together my own personal batch of uh, turf type tall fescue and creeping red fescue. This is, uh, uh, in my opinion, this is a very good mixture of grass types for a shady environment. Um, the turf type tall fescue is going to uh, have a lot of heat and drought tolerance during the summer, so you're not going to, and it's going to be taller, so you don't have to cut it as often, water it as much. Uh, you certainly could fertilize it, 
But if we mix in a good amount of creeping red fescue into it, which doesn't require a lot of fertilization to begin with, our fertilization needs for the entire lawn are actually going to be quite small over the course of the entire season. Also, that creeping red fescue uh, is going to give it pretty good uh, lasting color through the winter. So from my experience uh, growing uh, cool season grasses uh, in pots, uh, not necessarily here in the lawn, but in pots, I keep them outside during the winter. I could tell coloring of the uh, of the various types of grasses uh, during the cold months. So uh, the creeping red really kept a lot of color and it's got that rhizomatic nature to it, although it's very slow, it's creeping. Um, it will rhizomatically creep into any gaps in the lawn. So for those of you who are not like hardcore lawn care people kids back there going nuts uh for those of you who are not hard care lawn care people uh you're gonna find that uh, fescue lawns and a lot of perennial rye lawns get um overseeded regularly a lot of people will overseed seed back into that lawn every single fall almost every single year without question um and the reason for that is for thinning uh, these are bunch type grasses so if anything happens to kill off a small little patch of, of lawn whether it be you know a dog pee spot or i don't know a deer like digging into the ground sometimes kids fight a little bit guys keep it calm okay um any kind of damage happens to that lawn you gotta thicken it up guys i'm talking to some people here so keep it quiet okay no fighting. Life is a dad. So the creeping red fescue will provide those kinds of lawns uh, more of a repair ability. They'll be able to repair themselves a little bit um, over the years. So if you're not really a hardcore lawn care person, you can kind of get away with not overseeding every single year, maybe every few years or so. Uh, when you're in the mood, you might overseed it in the fall, and a creeping red will kind of keep it a little bit thicker. Hey, guys, can you play with the, the those toys over there? Can you play with those toys over there? They're pretty loud. Now, that's his lawn. That's what we're going to be doing over there. If you're following along with um, uh, my lawn here, uh, if you've been really following on closely, back, way back there on the hill yard over by the chickens, um, that's been rustic. I haven't really done anything to that ever outside of like the occasional watering and cutting it. Uh, this year, I'm planning on killing everything off and installing buffalo grass up there, which is a warm season grass type, which makes very little sense to have where I live because I live in cold territory. So I'm going to be mixing the stand. The reason I'm doing that is buffalo grass is a very uh, drought and heat tolerant grass. It grows naturally. It's one of the only, I think it's the only North American native turf grass variety. Um, and it grows from Texas all the way up to Montana. So of course, up in Montana, it's hardly green at all during the year because it's so cold up there. Uh, like your bookend um, season, spring and, and fall are pretty cold, pretty chilly. Uh, and that's what I got here. We live at elevation, so we kind of mimic a lot of that. And we're quite dry during the summer. But so I can't put that grass seed down until really late in the spring. I'm planning on putting that grass seed down probably at the end of May, maybe even in June. And I'm going to be doing some ninja tactics to get it to germinate as quickly as possible and kind of establish as quickly as possible, which I'll go into in big videos later in the season. Uh, but I'm going to be mixing it together with some annual ryegrass so that I can get a quick stand of green up there so it's not just a big dirt hill. Um, and then that annual ryegrass is going to die off in the fall. And at that point, I'm going to be overseeding clover into it. Clover is something that is not normally done uh, by, let's call it, uh, avid lawn care people. Uh, lots of people want to kill clover. I'm going to be planting it. I'm going to be putting it in the buffalo grass stand. I'm not going to put that in until the fall. And that's because uh, the competition of the grass seed as it's sprouting um, is going to be very different from the clover and the buffalo grass. Um, so I want to install them separately. It's kind of like how last year I, 
I planted ryegrass and then four or five months later, then I overseeded Kentucky bluegrass into it. That way I could get uh, good germination on both uh, grass types um, and pamper each grass type individually. So that's my process. I do have a couple small little patches that I'm going to be overseed or not overseeding, but spot repairing, uh, which will probably make it into some videos. Um, and I'm going to be experimenting with some pre-germination or more, uh, the better uh, description for it would probably be seed priming. So pre-germination um, is pretty hard to do, again, a large scale um, because you are literally pre-germinating the seed to the point where the root starts sprouting out. So once that root starts sprouting out, everything is wet. It's hard to brought now it becomes hard to broadcast spread with it with traditional lawn uh, grass seed spreaders. So you can mix it together with some other things, but it becomes challenging. If we just do seed priming, um, it becomes quite a bit easier and it still makes it a little bit easier to establish grass in the spring. So there will be videos on that. But let me take a look, see if there are questions. Somehow I missed a question here. I just overlooked it. I just seeded my backyard today with KBG from Digging in E. Good. What are your thoughts on controlling orchard grass? All right. So I'm going to guess that what you're talking about, I don't know orchard grass very, very specifically by name. When I talk on my channel about the undesirable grasses that I don't really know exactly what they are, I just call them the natural hillside patch of grasses, whatever. Um, orchard grass to me, what that means to me is more of a natural grass and they'll, most of those spread underground through rhizomes. So if I go around the edges of my yard, or edges of my property, I've got plenty of kind of natural hillside grasses that are not turf variety, uh, turf grass variety stands um, that exist. They're just natural on the hill. I would classify those collectively as an orchard grass. Or my cat's about ready to jump on the setup here. So I've got another video planned. Uh, I've never done this before, but this is a technique that I am going to try. I think it's going to work just fine. So one of the worst areas of my lawn for grasses that are creeping into my lawn uh, from the edges that I don't want that have these rhizomatic tendencies to it is I'm going to go to the edge of my lawn with an edger, like a deep edger, just a manual long handled tool style edger. And I'm going to sever as many of the rhizomes as I possibly can deep under the ground. Now I'm going to try to remove. Yes. Um, I think you should check your the things again because there's more um, comments. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about one right now. Okay. Yeah, I'll go through them. <laughs> My son is so interested in live streaming, uh, which I think is great. But uh, but anyway, I'll learn. I'll learn how to do it better. Uh, point here is I'm going to edge deeply. And then my plan is to go ahead and take uh, a non-selective herbicide or a grass killer herbicide with a paintbrush. I'm gonna let everything grow up because these orchard grasses or these pasture grasses tend to grow much faster and taller than your regular lawn grasses. At least that's my experience that happens. So if I go uh, between, I don't know, a few mowings without mowing the section that's infested, I'm gonna end up getting all these long little leaves of the grasses that I don't want. Now, if I've severed all of the uh, rhizomes underground at the fence line or wherever it is that you you know are getting your infestation coming from then I can go ahead and paint this non-selective herbicide right on the leaves like literally just a paintbrush just a little Crayola style paintbrush and just paint the herbicide straight onto the leaf on the time of the day that it works now if you've got tons and tons of it yeah this becomes more problematic and more difficult to do but if you've got a few stragglers and you don't want them to uh, flourish and take over an area uh, like I do, I think this is a way for me to get the job done. Now, it's going to be experimental. I've never tried it before, but uh, but that's my plan. Uh, certainly, you could just non-selective herbicide the whole area and uh, eliminate the problem of, of stuff coming in, infiltrating from the sites, and then just reseed. That's the obvious thing. Um, 
but that's not what I'm going to be trying to do. I like trying, I like trying things. So let's see what else we got here. Uh, excuse me, is creeping red fescue a fine blade fescue? Yes, it's very fine. It's one of the uh, fine fescues. So you've got creeping red, you've got sheep's fescue, you've got hard fescue, and you got chewing's fescue. Now, there's probably some obscure ones, um, but I've grown all of these uh, in pots. I've grown them all side by side as mono stands. Um, you can barely tell the difference. Uh, there is some coloring differences between them. Uh, in the summer and some coloring differences from them in the winter. Um, I do find that they hold up to very high heat very well when they're in the shade. Um, so, uh, but uh, creeping red is the fine fescue that will creep side to side through rhizomes. And that's why I like mixing it in. Most of the time, if you look at like a shade mix, a dense shade mix, uh, bag of grass seed, you're going to find a lot of fine fescue in there. Um, and usually you'll probably see some creeping red in there as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paddle duck. Hi, Kloof monster. That guy's a, a lifesaver sometimes. Uh, good luck with your germination. Thank you. Well, that's still a ways out. I actually have to start start the, the killing process of all the... Uh, weeds and grasses on that hill yard before I do the main thing, but um, certainly at the project lawns, those will be fun. We'll also do another uh, overseeing project over at uh, Robbie's project lawn. That's the one part of my Fix Your Lawn series. Uh, Poa annua, uh, tenacity is rated, I think, on the, on the uh, label as being able to kill Poa annua. Uh, really, in my opinion, um, if you have a Poa problem, like if it's a problem, I don't really care that much, honestly, if there's a little bit, but that's just my style. Um, I've got problems in my lawn all the time. So long as they're not like all encompassing and just overwhelming everything, I'm usually okay with it. I mean, I got toys in the yard at all times. So uh, my lawn is not a magazine cover almost ever. But if you have a significant problem with POA, then you really need to dial in a fall weed pre-emergence schedule. Now, I'm going to name drop here um, uh, how to with Doc. He put up a video, I'm going to call it maybe a month to six weeks ago about Poe and his lawn. And he showed how you could just like grab the tuft and just pull it out because it's got super shallow root systems. Um, I've never personally done that because I don't really have gigantic tufts of Poe in my lawn to do that on. But I thought it was pretty, uh, it was pretty solid illustration, something that's the style of thing that I would try to do. I'd be like, I'm going to just plant some Poe here so I could show you how to pull it out. Uh, if you got tufts, you could try that method. Uh, the point here is you want to get it out of the lawn before it goes to seed. Um, so some of it's going to go to seed, no matter how much you try, and you're going to get more POA seeds because it's an annual. So it'll seed and then germinate again in the fall. But that's the thing. It germinates in the fall. So if that's happening in your lawn, you need to put the pre-emergent down in the fall. This is a video that I made in the fall of 2021. I want to say it was September, October, something like that. I said is the most forgettable. I titled it the most forgettable lawn application of them all. It's the fall pre-emergent, in my opinion. Um, not a lot of people do it. It certainly isn't something that's talked about enough um, because all of the winter weeds that exist um, that are not perennials, that's when they're germinating in the fall time. So you really need to dial in, understand what you're what your soil temperatures are in the fall, uh, because as temperatures drop out of summer, a lot of stuff starts germinating. So if we put that, if we don't overseed in the fall and instead put down a pre-emergent then, then that's going to stop the vast majority of the POA from growing up in the first place. Um, I can't remember when I've said this, I, I'm pretty sure I've said this a number of times on videos, but when we're trying to kill plants, so whether it be a weed or a grass or anything, if you're trying to kill a plant, the easiest time to kill it is when it's super young. And I know this, I mean, we got we garden back there, we kill seedlings all the time on accident. Um, so if you have POA in the lawn and it's starting to germinate early in the season, let's 
I don't know, let's call it February, not germinate, but if it's starting to grow, coming out of winter dormancy. What's that, baby? You found what? Oh, you, you found treasures. That's beautiful. You want to go save it? Put it in your treasures. Put it with your treasures. Yeah, or in your pocket, yeah. You found some cool little pebbles. Um, oh, your pocket's right. Come here. Yeah, there it is. All right. Let's see if she lets me talk a little bit more here. Um, in the very early parts of the season, even now, it's April. So if you've got polo, um, which is notably different in your lawn than everything else, just try digging it out. Um, it might surprise you how shallow it is. Okay, your treasure. Yeah. Can I talk, please? Okay, thank you. you. Say hi. 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 Okay, just just let me talk, okay? We'll play again in a little bit. Um, so you can just try digging it out um, early, super early in the season. Uh, let's say, for instance, on a warm day, because every year that I can ever remember, at some point in the month of February, we had a random warm stretch. Um, you, could, um, you could apply... Um, a weed killer or a uh, let's call it a non-selective killer spot treat the the areas um, at that time um, you could use a tenacity you could try that um, at that time i'm not sure off the top of my head how low the temperature requirement is for that product uh, but it does go into leaf tissue so if a leaf is growing let's say a poa plant has come out of winter dormancy in the month of february it should be growing at that point so it should be able to absorb um, the product. Now, it might not absorb it very well because of outside air temperatures, but since it's so early in the season, it might work out anyway. Um, I'm not going to recommend that you do that, but it is an option for you to consider. The best way really is probably to just prevent the problem in the first place. If I had a lot of POA in the lawn, that's probably what I would do. I would just choose one year and say, I'm just going to manage it, try to keep it from seeding very much, mow it as frequently as I possibly could. And then in the fall time, find the right time of year to put that uh, pre-emergent down so that I don't have it in the following year. Seed priming sounds intriguing. I find it very intriguing, personally. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, in the lawn care, let's call it the YouTube ecosystem here, uh, pre-germination has come up a number of times from a number of other creators. I haven't discussed it on the channel. I have discussed it a couple times in a comment uh, here or there. But pre-germinating truly is, I'm just gonna dunk a whole bunch of seed into a bucket of water and submerge it for days. Um, and after a few days, let's call it two to three days for perennial rye, uh, five to six days for Kentucky bluegrass, um, same thing for, you know, if you're putting down zoysia grass seed or centipede, you could probably do the same thing. And it would be in there for a longer period of time. You'd have to change the water out a lot. But it, the point is you're getting it to the point where the, the, um, the germination, the root sprout, so comes out of the shell, the seed shell. Once that happens, then it becomes hard to, to spread it on the ground because just like any seedling, like if I plant like a little tomato plant and it sprouts and then I pull that seedling out of the soil, the root is exposed and it doesn't take very long for that root to die off. So it's very easy in my opinion, not that I've done it, but it's very easy in my opinion to kill a whole ton of seed doing a full seed germination. Not to mention the fact that it becomes far more complicated to, um, to spread it because you're dealing with wet seed that is um, uh, inflated. It's just like, you know, you take what are those little toys, little like bath sponge toys for the kids. They look like a little pill, like a medicine pill. You stick them in the bathtub and then they all expand all huge. The grass seed is kind of doing the same thing. So all of a sudden it becomes really hard to spread. Um, the priming, however, sounds complicated, but it's actually way easier. Quiet, buddy. It's actually way easier. Um, this is something that I will be doing, uh, this spring. Uh oh, we got some crying going on. What's up, baby? Did you get out to you? Do you need a kiss? Excuse me. I got to kiss my daughter. Yeah. 
two more. I gotta finish talking, okay? No. I'm almost done. I'm almost done, okay? You wanna go hang out with Sam? Yeah. Go show the Sam. Oh, well, they're gonna go watch me on the other computer. Um what was I saying? Priming. This is something I'm gonna be doing probably a few times. I'll probably do some test primes um, in pots in the garage, uh, inside the house, and windowsills uh, before I go ahead and do stuff out in the lawn. But it's it's related, but it's different. Let's say, for instance, you take one pound of grass seed, whatever the grass seed is. Um, uncoated is probably better to use than a coated grass seed. Uh, but if you take one pound of coated grass seed, uh, if you imagine each little granule of seed is um, like a little sponge, it can absorb water. So when we put it on the ground, we put the sprinkler on it, water goes onto it, and we're keeping it moist, and eventually it pops open and germinates. That's what, how it normally happens. But if we put the water on the seed just in a bag, but we don't submerge it, if we give it just enough water to saturate mostly all of the seed in the bag, but not like waterlog it, then what we're doing is we're basically moistening the seed and priming it. We're getting it ready to germinate. It's not actually quite ready to germinate, and it can still take on more water. It's like if you splash a little bit of water on a sponge, it is now moist. But, man, you could still probably add quite a bit more water before it's waterlogged. That's what we're doing to the seed. And once you do that, as you prime it, you get it moist enough, but you stop the process, like you don't waterlog it, and then you pull it out of the water and allow it to dry out after a couple of days. It just sounds like it's not going to work uh, because it sounds like we let seed dry out on the lawn and then it dies. Um, but in a controlled environment, what we're doing is we are, let's call it softening. I don't know if this is really the best, like, technical way of describing it but imagine we're softening the walls of the seed shell uh, we're pre-moistening it but we're not moistening it to the point where it's saturated all to all the way to the middle so we put that pound of grass seed and let's say we put roughly three quarters a pound of water in there if you do that all of the grass seed should absorb all of the water and actually be able to take on more if you were to give it to it but we're not going to give it to it. So we let it absorb in there and you jostle the bag around, you shake it up, make sure that everything gets adequately moist um, over a couple days. And then you can dry it out before you're ready to apply. So let's say, for instance, a Kentucky bluegrass grass seed needs to be on the lawn for 14 days to germinate. If we do this priming, I could do the priming now, I could do the priming in January and then put the grass seed out when it comes time to put the seed out. And instead of waiting 14 days, it might actually germinate on the lawn in like six to seven days. This is particularly helpful for those slow to germinate grass seed varieties um, where you really need to wait for soil temperatures to get up high enough to put the seed down. Uh, but at the same time, um, the longer you wait to put the seed down, then you have to wait all this time for it to germinate, and then it's too late in the season because the seedlings are too small. So this is a good way of tightening up that window. And that's what I'm going to be doing to the buffalo grass. Uh, and I might even be doing it to um, uh, to the glyphosate um, project lawn, Phil's lawn, um, because we get overnight cold temperatures all the way into, like our, our final frost date of the year on average is in June. So... If I wait till we're not having like frosty weather overnight, I'm putting grass seed down very late in the season. So I have to cover it with frost blankets, which is things that I've done before. But I've also, uh, I also think that this is another fantastic viable way of getting it going. Uh oh, hey guys, hey guys, let's keep it calm. Yeah. We okay? It's okay, Jacob. He's little. He's little. You're little too. Little kid problems. Um, all right. Here we go. How to best fertilize turf type called fescue during this time of year? Well, 
my normal this is my normal response to just fertilizing in early spring. I really prefer organic, natural, slow release products. Out? Yeah, what's out? Yeah. I'll be out in oh about maybe fifteen minutes, okay? Okay. High five. Hug. Here. You wanna sit on my lap for a little bit? Yeah. All right. This is my daughter. This is why I do it. Um, that's part of why I do it. I got other kids too. Um, but anyway, uh, the slow release stuff is what I prefer. And it really is, especially in the early spring, you don't need to push heavy growth. You just don't. It's going to start going on its own um, unless there's a true need to do it. So if you're going to be doing um, leveling, uh, you need fast, vigorous growth. So that might be a reason to use something. Um, I usually, oh, you want to go play? No. You want to go play? No. You want to go find a candy, an Easter candy? Jacob, you want to go get some Easter candy? Come here. Come here, Jacob can help. Jacob can help. Bye. So um, let me regroup. regroup. This is the type of stuff that gets edited out of main videos. This happens all the time. Every time I record, that's why I don't do live streams. Um, if you need vigorous growth for some certain thing, then you'll probably use uh, a fast release nitrogen. Now, one of my pet peeves is you'll find bags of fertilizer all the time saying that this is slow release or controlled release, but still using uh, urea or urea trizone or sulfur coated urea or some coated thing, some way of slowing the release of the urea down. The thing is it's used quickly. So once, uh, once it's in the lawn, it's just used quickly compared to um, plant and animal sourced sources or your malorganites or your fake malorganites of the world. Um, they really just provide slower nutrition. So it just takes longer for everything in the lawn to break that stuff down. Um, and then it feeds the soil, especially if you're using, you know, plant and animal sources of nitrogen in the lawn. Uh, it just feeds the soil. It helps the microbiology uh, going on down in there. Um, in cold weather, it's true that uh, these kinds of ways of fertilizing aren't going to be used very quickly. So like if I put fertilizer down in the month of uh, March, when we were having snow on the ground, uh, is not going to go away. It's just going to sit on the ground until it slowly gets used up. And because I have mycorrhizal activity in my lawn space, mycorrhizal, that fungal activity, the beneficial fungal activity, will actually slowly break uh, this stuff down as well, just slower than the, uh, than the uh, microorganisms that we think of during the summer months when the soil temperatures are warmer. So that's how I would fertilize it. Um, again, you really need to pair, in my opinion, it's very purpose, very important, especially for turf type tall fescue, because it's frequently grown down in that transition zone where it can get quite humid. Um, you really need to, to do a really good job at pairing your nitrogen and your potassium together. This is a recurring theme on my channel. Uh, that potassium is really going to help sustain growth. So the nitrogen, any fertilizer put down with nitrogen is going to push growth at various speeds. But if you don't have enough potassium in there to, to pair it together for them to hold hands, um, then that growth is going to be a little bit weaker growth. So um, it's going to be a little bit more susceptible, just a little bit more susceptible to things like heat, drought, and fungal, uh, fungal threats. So like for instance, a malorganite, this is my malorganite video from not that long ago, uh, is nitrogen and phosphorus, but there's no potassium. Um, there are other products that I could use. I just used one on, oh, the video's coming out on Monday. It's not even out yet. So here's a sneak peek uh, over at Robbie's lawn, the project lawn over there, the slow repair lawn that we're doing. Uh, we put down um, Scott's natural uh, fertilizer, just a big box store bag of natural fertilizer. It's all based on uh, animal-based sources, um, except for the potassium. I can't remember off the top of my head where that's from. But um, but all the nitrogen and phosphorus is coming from animal-based sources. So 
we're at least getting some potassium there. Now there are other dedicated products. I have another video uh, that I released about a month ago all about uh, my addition of SOP into my fertilization program. That way I can, whatever I'm putting down, I can always add in a little bit of potassium to kind of get the ratio in line for my liking. Now I always get comments about people saying, well, what nutrients do you have in your lawn already? Are you already high in potassium? In my opinion, it doesn't matter. If I'm putting if I'm putting four pounds of nitrogen down on my lawn over the course of a year. Oh, did, did Jacob find the candy? Come here. Here, hold on. I got to go get candy. I'll be right back. Yes, you can. Go ahead. So, um, so anyway, um, was I saying, yeah, that if I'm putting four pounds of nitrogen on the lawn over the course of an entire year, then that nitrogen doesn't require, but it's going to perform optimally if it is paired with two and a half pounds of potassium. Like that's the ratio. Um, so, if I'm putting two and a half pounds of potassium on the lawn, and this is going to slightly differ depending on the grass type. Um, and, you know, there are like university studies that I've read that have supported this uh, ratio that I go off of in my own head. So if I apply two and a half pounds of potassium over the course of a year and four pounds of nitrogen, then whatever potassium is in my soil is not going to change. It's going to be used at the same rate that it's being applied based on the nitrogen add that I have. So if I'm putting instead of four pounds of nitrogen, let's say I put two pounds of nitrogen down on the ears. So uh, lots of uh, beginners to lawn care, they're not going to go out there and fertilize five, six times a year. They'll fertilize twice maybe. Um, and so if you're only putting two pounds of nitrogen down, instead of getting two and a half pounds of potassium, then you're putting one in 1.25. So my recommendation is to do your slow um, natural fertilization program in the early parts of spring so that it is used throughout the spring. And then make sure, depending on what product you use, that you're getting enough potassium in there to support the growth. Because if that growth isn't supported, then come summer when heat, drought, and fungal threats are at their highest, then, um, it's going to perform better. <laughs> Kloof monster, what's poa annual? It's an annual bluegrass. It dies off every year, reseeds. It's a little bit yellow green, it usually grows faster and taller than everything else. It's a little bit annoying. It kind of looks like you've got an unkempt yard no matter how often you mow it. Where is the line between having enough good grass to keep going versus burning it down and starting all over? It's a very personal question. It's a very personal question. Um, my friends who are here at the house today uh, playing, they um, have the ability to stay off of their lawn and they would like to see quick results. So quick results is kill the lawn, prepare the soil, seed. Within a couple of months, everything's completely done. Um, my other project lawn, Robbie's house, they don't really have the ability to just stay off their lawn for two months. Um, so like they have a bunch of kids like myself, that are running all over. They have animals. You don't really see them in the videos outside of the dog, but they have dogs, cats, they have chickens, they have goats, and they live in the middle of nature. So they're constantly having animals going all over the place. They have to be in their lawn. And so 
if you go to kill everything off, yeah, you can kill everything off, but it's usually going to take a couple rounds um, of glyphosate. So that right there um, is difficult enough for the average Joe. Um, certainly anyone can do it. It's not that big of a deal. But, um, but you're using harder chemicals. A lot of people have, um, they're squeamish about using harsher chemicals. But then it's the seeding process that is very challenging for a lot of different people in this country, really, the world, I guess. Um, if you have a whole ton of animals and pets and children who need to be on the lawn all the time, it becomes very difficult to seed a lawn. Uh, so yeah, you could kill everything off and then try to reseed it. But at this point, we're running sprinklers a few times every day to try to get grass to grow. And so it's always a little bit wet out there. And depending on the grass type that you have, it's going to take, you know, between five days and 21 days to get the seed to sprout. And then at that point, you still can't have like dogs trampling all over, goats trampling all over your lawn. Around here, we have deer every single day in my lawn. I can't, it's hard to have the deer in the lawn and grow seed. So I cover it and that actually helps. But um, the bigger your lawn space is, the harder it is to cover. So if it's detrimental to your, your lifestyle, then it's really a hard choice. You're like, well, I, we need to just go the slow route. And there's nothing wrong with the slow route. I find that the slow route is interesting uh, and it's, you get this sense of anticipation uh, doing it. Um, it's exciting to find out if what you did worked um, better or worse than what you expected. And I think you learn a heck of a lot more uh, doing that than just killing and reseeding. If you kill and reseed, you're actually not learning anything about lawn care. You're learning about how to kill a lawn and how to grow grass from seed. But you're not learning anything about lawn care, like how to tend or maintain that lawn. Uh, doing the slow route is a great way of doing that. I never um, am a proponent of making a lawn look like a magazine cover um, just to say it looks better than everyone else's. Um, lawns are, in my opinion, uh, for use. Um, I got my kid back here lurking over my shoulder because I want him outside. I want all of the kids outside. I want the chaos going on behind me. Um, and I want to I want to learn how to do it. So it's okay for me to gradually improve things over time. And if you have that ability or that mental stamina to stick with it and, and be okay with gradual improvement, then I think that's the line. And I guess, I don't know, more of that question, good grass versus burning it down and starting all over. If you've got some grass in your lawn, um, this is something that I learned years ago way before I tended to my lawn uh, from Alan Hain. Uh, he's like, there's grass in your lawn, even if you can't see it, like it's there. It might be, it might be like 90% weed, but there is grass there. And so if we push the grass and stunt the weed, then that ratio is going to change over time. Certainly, if we've got self-repairing grasses like your Kentucky blue grasses, your creeping reds, your rhizomatic tall fescues, which I don't have personal experience with, uh, or any of the warm season grasses, they'll self-repair as well. So if we push that grass and suppress the weeds, in time, things will get better. Now, my project line over at Robbie's house is a good example of that. I'm really anxious for May, late May to come around because that's going to be the 12 month mark where we started from probably about 90, 95% uh, weeds in his lawn at that time. And now the ratio is significantly better. So I'm looking forward to the 12 month uh, interval side-by-side -side picture shot. Careful buddy, this is loud when you're here. All right, um, my daughter is demanding more candy, more Easter candy. Uh, one of the bigger problems with Easter is that there's candy all over the place at all times. Yeah, bonbon bon candies. It's all good. Uh, paddle deck. 72 degree will be 90 degrees the next two days. I'm just looking forward to getting two days close to 70 degrees in a row, honestly. I, I 
just feel like this, oh, we had a nice warm snap in late January and of mid-February, but it's just been a long cold weather season for us. Uh, Michael, if I ever sprayed in the fall and wait for it to germinate, can I, let's see, if I overseed in the fall and wait for it to germinate, can I put down a pre-emergent to stop Poe annual? Most likely not. Um, most likely not because it's too close together. Uh-oh. I got an emergency. I shall entertain you with my PBJ. Um, I got this thing. I'm it's supposed to be a top, I think. No, it's a magnet thing. I don't know what it is. But it's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna see how long it can spin. Really. Yeah. been spinning for a very long time now. <laughs> I was entertaining. What are you doing? You entertaining everybody? Yeah, well. Come on, watch it. Okay. Please sit down. Bye-bye. All right. It is highly possible. <laughs> it is highly possible that I'll have to stop this here soon. So... Big jig. Thinking about using tenacity. The dandelions are everywhere. Just saw mushrooms popping up in my lawn as well. Uh, mushrooms, in my opinion, are usually a good sign. Uh, mushrooms are the underground. It's the flower for an underground network of positive fungal activity. Usually uh, that fungal activity is breaking down organic matter in the lawn, releasing, um, releasing nutrients uh, into the soil. Um, and into your plants through the roots and through the mycorrhizal network. So I am fine with mushrooms. Now, I don't want my kids going out there plucking mushrooms and jump, you know, putting them into their into their mouths. Uh, but the mushroom is basically a flower and it releases spores, which are basically the seeds. So think about a dandelion, you know, the flower comes up and then it turns white and all the seeds distribute. That's basically what's happening with the mushroom, but it's not usually a bad thing. Some people just don't like the way it looks or they don't really understand uh, the benefits of it. Uh, the dandelions are definitely everywhere. That's, I've got them on my hill yard and I'm doing some experiments on what kinds of products kill them better. It's Mickey Mouse. So, um, so anyway, uh, there is a video that I'm producing where I'm trying three products side by side by side on my patch of dandelions to see which one works a little bit better. Um, hopefully it will be helpful. Um, I am doing it in colder weather, so it might not be a perfect example of um, what products to use for everybody in all climates. Uh, also, I have a video last year where I, I talked about the benefits of not killing off your dandelions. So usually dandelions are in lawn spaces that um, 
I mean, I got a few here in the lawn here, but usually you get like infestations of dandelions in places where you don't have tons and tons of thick grass. So those dandelions, the root systems go down, they grow, they actually kind of aerate the ground a little bit. And of course they support um, uh, the pollinators, you know, the, um, the things that we want, but not everybody really wants it in their yard. It's like, we want pollinators in someone else's yard, but not ours. Uh, that's a pretty common scenario. So um, you can take a look at that if you're interested. However, this spring I am gonna be killing off the dandelions um, on my hill yard because once I install clover later in the year, I'm gonna have limited use of herbicides to kill weeds uh, without damaging the clover. Something that I'm doing a lot of like research on. Bon, bon, my daughter is telling me I should finish. Um, this is chaos. I knew that this was going to be chaos when I started this. Um, in fact, I warned a lot of you that it would be chaos. Also, my son's moving things around on me and everything. Okay, thank you, buddy. So um, I appreciate the uh, the number of you, the handful of you. Um, that have stuck around and watched parts of this. Um, I don't know if anyone really watched the whole thing, but um, I'm going to try to edit this together a little bit and publish it online so it's a little bit chaotic, a little bit less chaotic for uh, for watching later on. Um, but mostly use the comment box. In the comment box, I can respond to comments um, in a far more controlled environment with less um, silliness going on around me and uh, childhood demands on me as a father. So put those comments down there and I'll try to answer them. Um, let's see here, Paddle Duck, like a boss, hopefully. There's Vaz, I like seeing you guys, you in the comments too. Paddle Duck, I'm low on potassium, should put more down. Thanks for the reminder. I have Langbonite crystals. Um, um, if you're low on potassium, definitely do it. Um, there are catch up products out there um yard mastery has their stress blend which is a 7020 i think it is um certainly langbonite is 022 and um sulfate of potash is um 048 these things are very easy to just add in to whatever you're normally doing so if you're applying something in the month of may you can always just add in a little bit of this to kind of catch up on that potassium I miss my kids being little. Got to run. Thanks, Paddle. Your kids are awesome. Thank you, Ruben. Big Jim. Appreciate going on the why. Why I do the channel. Thank you. I have to, I have to try to enjoy this. Like everyone that is older than me who have kids that have grown, every single one of them say that I will miss all of this. And I know many of you watching our our parents, both active parents or, you know, parents of grown adults. Um, so hopefully you guys understand uh, this. This is awesome. And I try to, I don't know, I try to remember that everyone who's gone on before has said that this is something that I will miss once it's gone. So you have to enjoy it in the present. So that's what we try to do. So we get a little bit of <laughs> Mickey Mouse clubhouse there's poop inside is that what you said yeah so we got dirt all over the place and um but anyway it is fun if you can uh if you can tolerate craziness at all times of the day so um thank you all for watching and i'm gonna try to do a small series of grassy videos um on the channel if I can find the time to do it, but I'll certainly answer questions. So thank you very much. Let me figure out how to stop this. <laughs> Take care all.